Solid Objects by Virginia Woolf, read by Kiara Colinda Jelly. The only thing that moved upon the vast semicircle of the beach was one small black spot. As it came nearer to the ribs and spine of the stranded boat, it became apparent from a certain tenuity in its blackness that this spot possessed four legs, and moment by moment it became more unmistakable that it was composed of the persons of two young men. Even thus, in the outline against the sand, there was an unmistakable vitality in them, an indescribable vigor in the approach and withdrawal of the bodies. Slight though it was, which proclaimed some violent argument issuing from the tiny mouths of the little round heads, this was corroborated on closer view by the repeated lunging of a walking stick on the right-hand side. Politics be damned, issued clearly from the body on the left-handed side. And, as these words were uttered, the mouths, noses, chins, little mustaches, tweed caps, rough boots, shooting coats, and check stockings of the two speakers became clearer and clearer. The smoke of their pipes went up into the air, nothing was so solid, so living, so hard, red, as these two bodies for miles and miles of sea and sand hill. They flung themselves down by the six ribs and spine of the black boat. You know how the body seems to shake itself free from an argument, and to apologize for a mood of exaltation, flinging itself down and expressing in the looseness of its attitude a readiness to take up with something new whatever it may be that comes next to hand. So Charles, whose stick who had been slashing the beach for half a mile or so, began skimming flat pieces of slate over the water, and John, who had exclaimed, politics be damned, began burrowing his fingers down down into the sand, and his hand went further and further beyond the wrist, so that he had to hitch his sleeve a little higher. His eyes lost their intensity, or rather the background of thought and experience which gives an unscrutable depth to the eyes of grown people disappeared, leaving only the clear transparent surface expressing nothing but wonder which the eyes of young children display. No doubt the act of burrowing in the sand had something to do with it. He remembered that after digging for a little, the water oozes around your fingertips, the hole then becomes a moat, a well, a spring, a secret channel to the sea. As he was choosing which of these things to make it, they curled round something hard, a full drop of solid matter, and gradually dislodged a large irregular lump, and brought it to the surface. When the sand coating was wiped off, a green tint appeared. It was a lump of glass, so thick as to be almost opaque. The smoothing of the sea had completely worn off any edge or shape, so that it was impossible to say whether it had been a bottle, tumbler, or window pane. It was nothing but glass, it was almost a precious stone. You had only to enclose it in a rim of gold or pierce it with a wire and it became a jewel, part of a necklace or a dull green light upon a finger. Perhaps after all it was really a gem, something worn by a dark princess trailing her finger in the water as she sat in the stern of the boat and listened to the slaves singing as they rowed her across the bay, or the oak sides of a sunk Elizabethan treasure chest. John turned it in his hands, he held it to the light, he held it so that its irregular mass blotted out the body and extended right arm of his friend. The green thinned and thickened slightly, as it was held against the sky or against the body. It pleased him, it puzzled him, it was so hard, so concentrated, so definite an object compared to the vague sea and the hazy shore. Now a sigh disturbed him, profound, final, making him aware that his friend Charles had thrown all the flat stones within reach, or had come to the conclusion that it was not worthwhile to throw them. They ate their sandwiches side by side. When they had done, and they were shaking themselves and rising to their feet, John took the lump of glass and looked at it in silence. Charles looked at it too, but he saw immediately that it was not flat, and filling his pipe, he said with the energy that dismisses a foolish strain of thought, to return to what I was saying, he did not see, or if he had seen, would hardly have noticed that John, after looking at the lump for a moment, as if in hesitation, slipped it inside his pocket. That impulse, too, may have been the impulse which leads a child to pick up one pebble on a path strewn with them, promising it a life of warmth and security upon the nursery mantelpiece, and believing that the heart of the stone leaps with joy when it sees itself chosen from a million like it, to enjoy this bliss instead of a life cold and wet upon the high road. It might so easily have been any other of the millions of stones, but it was I. Whether this thought or not was in John's mind, the lump of glass had its place upon the mantelpiece, 
where it stood heavy upon a little pile of bills and letters, and served not only as an excellent paperweight, but also as a natural stopping place for the young man's eyes when they wandered from his book. Looked at it again and again, half consciously, by a mind thinking of something else. Any object mixes itself so profoundly with the stuff of thought that it loses its actual form and recomposes itself a little differently in an ideal shape, which haunts the brain when we least expect it. So John found himself attracted to the windows of curiosity shops when he was out walking, merely because he saw something which reminded him of the lump of glass. Anything so long as it was an object of some kind, more or less round, perhaps with a dying flame deep sunk in its mass. Anything, china, glass, amber, rock, marble, even the smooth oval egg of a prehistoric bird would do. He took also to keeping his eyes upon the ground, especially in the neighborhood of waste and where the household refuse is thrown away. Such objects often occurred there, thrown away, of no use to anybody, shapeless, discarded. In a few months, he had collected four or five specimens that took their place upon the mantelpiece. They were useful too, for a man who is standing for parliament upon the brink of a brilliant career has any number of papers to keep in order. Addresses, declarations of policy, appeals for subscriptions, invitations to dinner, and so on. One day, starting from his rooms in the temple to catch a train in order to address his constituents, his eyes rested upon a remarkable object lying half hidden in one of those little borders of grass, which edged the basis of the vast legal buildings. He could only touch it with the point of his stick through the railings, but he could see that it was a piece of china of the most remarkable shape, as nearly resembling a starfish as anything, shaped or broken accidentally into five irregular but unmistakable points. The coloring was mainly blue, but green stripes or spots of some kind overlaid the blue, and lines of crimson gave it a richness and luster of the most attractive kind. John was determined to possess it, but the more he pushed, the further it receded. At length, he was forced to go back to his rooms and improvise a wire ring attached to the end of a stick, with which, by dint of great care and skill, he finally drew the piece of china within reach of his hands. As he seized hold of it, he exclaimed in triumph, at that moment, the clock struck. It was out of the question that he should keep his appointment. The meeting was held without him. But how had the piece of china been broken into this remarkable shape? A careful examination put it beyond doubt that the star shape was accidental, which made it all the more strange, and it seemed unlikely that there should be another such in existence. Set at the opposite end of the mantelpiece from the lump of glass that had been dug from the sand, it looked like a creature from another world. It seemed to be pirouetting through space, winking light like a fitful star, the contrast between the china, so vivid and alert, and the glass, so mute and contemplative, fascinated him, and wondering and amazed, he asked himself how the two came to exist in the same world, let alone to stand upon some narrow strip of marble in the same room. The question remained unanswered. He now began to haunt the places which are most prophylic of broken china, such as pieces of wasteland between railway lines, sites of demolished houses, and commons in the neighborhood of London. But China is seldom thrown away from a great height. It is one of the rarest human actions. You have to find in conjunction a very high house, and a woman of such reckless impulse and passionate prejudice that she flings her jar or pot straight from the window without thought of who is below. Broken China was to be found in plenty, but broken in some trifling domestic accident without purpose or character. Nevertheless, he was often astonished as he came to go into the question more deeply by the immense variety of shapes to be found in London alone, and there was still more cause for wonder and speculation in the differences of qualities and designs. The finest specimens he would bring home and place upon his mantelpiece, their duty was more and more of an ornamental nature since papers needing a way to keep them down became scarcer and scarcer. He neglected his duties, perhaps, or discharged them absentmindedly, or his constituents, when they visited him, were unfavorably impressed by the appearance of his mantelpiece. At any rate, he was not elected to represent them in Parliament, and his friend Charles, taking it much to heart and hurrying to condole him, found him so little cast down by the disaster that he could only suppose that it was too serious of a matter for him to realize all at once. In truth, John had been that day to Barnes Common, and there under a furze bush had found a very remarkable piece of iron. It was almost identical with glass in shape, massy and globular, but so cold and heavy, so black and metallic, that it was evidently alien to the earth and had its origin in one of the dead stars, or was itself the cinder of a moon. It weighted his pocket down, it weighted the mantelpiece down, it radiated cold. 
and yet the meteorite stood upon the same ledge with the lump of glass and the star-shaped china. As his eyes passed from one to another, the determination to possess objects that even surpassed these tormented young men, he devoted himself more and more resolutely to the search. If he had not been consumed by ambition and convinced that one day some newly discovered rubbish he would reward him, the disappointments he had suffered, let alone the fatigue, would have made him give up the pursuit. Provided with a bag and a long stick fitted with an adaptable hook, he ransacked all deposits of the earth, raked beneath matted tangles of scrub, searched all alleys and spaces between walls where he had learned to expect to find objects of this kind thrown away. As his standard became higher and his taste more severe, the disappointments were innumerable. But always some gleam of hope, some piece of china or glass curiously marked or broken lured him on. Day after day passed, he was no longer young. His career, that is his political career, was a thing of the past. People gave up visiting him. He was too silent to be worth asking to dinner. He never talked to anyone about his serious ambitions. Their lack of understanding was apparent in their behavior. He leaned back in his chair now and watched Charles lift the stones on his mantelpiece a dozen times and put them down empathetically to mark what he was saying about the conduct of government without once noticing their existence. What was the truth of it, John? Asked Charles, suddenly turning and facing him. What made you give it up all in a second? I've not given it up, John replied, but you've not the ghost of a chance now, said Charles roughly. I don't agree with you there, said John with conviction. Charles looked at him and was profoundly uneasy. The most extraordinary doubts possessed him. He had a queer sense that they were talking about different things. He looked round to find some relief for his horrible depression, but the disorderly appearance of the room depressed him still further. What was that stick and the old carpet bag hanging against the wall? And then those stones, looking at John, something fixed and distant in his expression alarmed him. He knew only too well that his mere appearance upon a platform was out of the questions. Pretty stones, he said as cheerfully as he could. And saying that he had an appointment to keep, he left John. Forever.